All right, so let's, we'll get started, guys. Thanks for joining us, um, for uh, being here for this next installment of the Ultrasound Lecture Series. Um, it's good to be kind of back in my office. I've had some, I've been off and on for the last couple of months, just with some uh, family leave after the birth of our our daughter. So it's been it's good to be back and just kind of in the saddle here and just kind of uh, rolling again with the Ultrasound Lecture Series. So um, today we are going to talk. I changed gears a little bit. I know I sent out the email saying we're going to talk about renal ultrasound. Um, cause I thought we were still on our renal block for, um, our fellowship and Sandy informed me that no, actually we are in our OB block now. So I changed gears to OB a little bit. So I hope you guys don't mind. Uh, most of ED folks, we got to do both anyway. Uh, Brittany, uh, hope you don't mind, uh, talking a little about OB and, um, for, you know, Ashley from the, the surgical side as well. Um, but that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, about pregnancy and, um, without trying to make it too, dis um, too, uh, depressing, we're going to talk a little bit about failed pregnancy. Uh, so those of you who's rotated with us, we've talked a little bit about kind of the normal first trimester ultrasound and kind of how you kind of process through just that normal part. You know, so what what do you see? Kind of what do you measure? Kind of how do you decide this is a normal intrauterine pregnancy? But what becomes a challenge is how do we decide when there's complications, right? Um, and so we'll spend this week talking a little bit about the complications. And one of the potential complications is failed pregnancy. Um, and so, yes, I know it's a little bit depressing um, as we get into the holiday season, but I think this is something that's important to talk about because uh, it's something that we see from time to time that comes into the ED and kind of how to make that diagnosis and use the tools uh, at our disposal to, to really to make that diagnosis. Let me put myself in here so you can see as I'm talking. Um, so let's get moving. Uh, so the objectives of today's talk are really going to be twofold, right? To discuss basic ultrasound in the first trimester and really not, we're not going to review all the different windows and things like that, but you'll see it come up as we kind of talk about kind of the different ultrasound windows that we have and kind of the different things that we're going to look at in the first trimester and really hone in on defining some criteria to define pregnancy failure. And this is a really important thing to define because um, it, I mean, they're big decisions and um, a lot of things hinge on this. And so it's really important to get this right uh, and not to, not to um, kind of gloss over this. So as always, let's start with a little bit of a case, just to kind of get our mind prepped and kind of warmed up. Um, get us thinking along that line. So you're working in ED West, you're working in urgent care, you're working in fast track, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you're consulted to see somebody, um, you know, who's pregnant, 24 year old female, this is a completely made up case. Uh, but it will be very, um, you know, illustrative of the cases that we see down in the emergency department, uh, or in these various different settings. So 24 year old female, uh, let's say she's a G3 P2, right? So uh, two previous live births, kids, I don't know, pick an age, you know, they can make them, you know, five and three for whatever, you know. Um, so now she's coming in for a third, she's got lower abdominal cramping, right? She's got vaginal bleeding. And this all started last night, right? All this, you know, since last night. And so this is obviously disquieting for the, the patient. She's uh, come to the emergency department, and she's here to seek our help and kind of see what what needs to be, uh, what's going on, what needs to be done, right? Uh, so you do your exam, right? You get that history. Um, it's, pelvic pain feels like a period she's got some bleeding it's more than spotting um you notice on exam that there's blood in the vault right when you do the bimanual the cervix is closed right so we don't have uh, an obvious um you know miscarriage in process um so blood in the vault cervix closed and you get a you know urine hcg and it's positive i mean you expect it to be so she took you know a handful of tests at home she said they're all positive at home so big surprise it's positive here right so that's kind of what you're given. What's the next step, right? What do you want to do? What do we need to do for this, um, you know, this woman who's sitting in front of us uh, kind of with this complaint? And that's kind of what we're going to talk about. And so as we go through this, as I kind of talk to patients um, in this regard, I say, hey, look, you know, your, your pregnancy test is positive. We got some vaginal bleeding. There's probably one of three things going on here, right? One, this could be a viable pregnancy. Like certainly you can have some implantation bleeding. Um, two, it could be a non-viable pregnancy. I mean, it's a very binary yes or no, right? Um, but we'll throw in the third one just because it's we have to think about it. It could be an ectopic pregnancy. And certainly the way I think about it is the degree of bleeding correlates with the, the risk of a fetal loss, right? So for the viable one, if they have just a little bit of spotting here and there, um, you know, it could just be some implantation bleeding. Um, everything could be fine, right? Um, but it's that bleeding increases, right? As it becomes more and more period-like, um, now we need to be concerned, is this a non-viable pregnancy, um, you know, i.e. a miscarriage, um, but you always have to be thinking in the back of your mind, is this an ectopic pregnancy? And I know there's one study that I ran across years ago, I think it was in the New England Journal, um, 
that said that the 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 percentage of patients presenting the emergency departments in the first trimester who are symptomatic, right? So you have women, first trimester, symptomatic, the percentage of those who have ectopic pregnancies, and that study was about 10%, right? Which to me seems a little bit high, um, certainly doesn't correlate with my, um, my experience of 10% of my, my symptomatic first trimester patients. Um, but I mean, I think whatever the number it is, it's illustrative of the fact that ectopic pregnancies are not an uncommon thing and that we need to be worried about that, right? So these are the really the big three things that I, you know, will talk to, you know, my patients like here, here's what's going on. Uh, here's what could be the possible outcomes. And we need to work it up to this end um, and really kind of figure out what we're going with. Um, that being said, oftentimes it's not that straightforward, you know, as we're seeing the patient. And so oftentimes, as we do our workup, we're left with this pregnancy of undetermined location, right? Um, and that's really gonna be the challenge is kind of what do we do with this whole category of you're serologically pe pregnant, but we can't find the thing, right? We don't know if it clearly fits in with the viable, non-viable, maybe you've passed it, uh, or is it ectopic just hiding somewhere and, you know, we can't find it. Um, and so, you know, traditionally we think about, you know, our different treatment methods for each of these different uh, categories, um, but it can become problematic, right? So let's assume we have the diagnosis of an ectopic pregnancy, right? Um, you know, you have a non-viable pregnancy, or excuse me, um, a non-identified location, right? You have a, you know, positive urine HCG, and maybe even you get a positive serum HCG, right? Um, one particular study, this one, uh, showed that in patients with uh, a negative ultrasound, right, they did not find an intrauterine pregnancy and an HCG greater than 2000, right? So um, they're definitely pregnant and they have a, a significantly identifiable serum HCG, um, or they had an abnormal rise and fall of that HCG. There was a 40% um, rate of of, of mis misdiagnosis, right? So um, as you said, 40% of the patients were initially diagnosed as ectopic based on these findings and actually, you know, were, you know, were not, right? Were something else. Um, these may actually be viable, right? And so if you're wrong 40% of the time, calling it an ectopic, and it may actually be a viable pregnancy that you just haven't um, identified yet. I mean, that has catastrophic consequences uh, for all parties involved, right? Um, and so, I mean, this goes without saying, if you methotrexate, you know, a viable pregnancy, it just it doesn't turn out well, right? In this study, there was eight women who were given methotrexate for, um, and, and found to have viable pregnancies, ultimately, um, and only two of those resulted in live births, but both of those, um, those live births were se severely uh, malformed, right? So this certainly creates a lot of excess mortality, um, but also creates a lot of just, um, you know, emotional unrest for the, the mom who's now got to deal with the fact that, you know, this happened um, you know, in her pregnancy. So we want to be really right on this thing, right? Um, so there's the rest of the paper. Um, the other thing is, um, what about the initial diagnosis of miscarriage, right? And so in 2011, this group from the UK um, really looked at diagnostic criteria for miscarriage, you know, on in the initial ultrasound, right? Um, and so as part of the paper, they basically said for patients diagnosed as a miscarriage using only historical data, right? So we're not talking about ultrasound data, right? But only historical data. Hey, I'm coming in, I have a lot of bleeding, I'm concerned about this bleeding, it might be a, mi a miscarriage. The false positivity rate for miscarriage or inappropriately diagnosed as a miscarriage when it was something else was about 8%, right? So I think what this tells us is that our history and exam alone really aren't necessarily sufficient to be able to definitively make this call, right? Um, and, you know, missing some things is, you know, has certain, you know, minimal consequences, but missing this can be catastrophic, right? Because this is an extraordinarily emotional time uh, for parents, right? Who are, um, you know, kind of going through a lot, you know, whether they want to get pregnant, um, you know, or have been struggling to get pregnant or various things like that. Um, so to miss this, to screw this up, it can be extraordinarily devastating and overwhelming. So there's a lot on the line. It's kind of where I'm going with this one. Um, and as physicians, right, on our side, you know, it seems like we may be walking kind of this tightrope, you know, we are trying to tactfully manage the patient's understanding of kind of what's going on um, in the context of like their fears and their emotions. Uh, but also we need to medically and accurately identify kind of, you know, what's going on here, um, you know, so that we don't really, you know, make these errors that are going to lead to catastrophic, catastrophic outcomes. And so, um, you know, that's kind of the, the tension or the balance that we're trying to strike here um, as we're as we're kind of processing through this, right? So the big question is, with this tension in mind, right, you don't want to err on the side of extra, excess maternal um, mortality or morbidity, you know, if you miss an ectopic, right? Uh, 
You also don't want to err on the ex- side of excess fetal mor- you know, mor- morbidity or mortality if you call it an ectopic and, and it's not, right? Um, so is there any data to help um, as we kind of process through this and add to or layer over top of our history and physical exam um, you know, to, to make this determination? The answer is yes, right? There is data out there. Um, and this, this paper kind of really illustrates um, that data. So we're going to dive into this uh, over the course of the lecture, right? So this paper was published um, New England Journal, uh, 2013, by a, a guy named Peter Dublay uh, and his colleagues, um, and they really looked at the current uh, diagnostic criteria for non-viable pregnancy and kind of revised those a little bit because um, he was concerned about the you know the c- scenario that we were just talking about, where you have you inappropriately diagnose a viable pregnancy as non-viable, whether it be um, miscarriage or ectopic, and um, you know, and you give, give the treatments that are, you know, warranted for those situations. And then all of a sudden, you know, you realize, oops, that was a viable pregnancy, right? So we're going to dive into this, this paper and talk about it a little bit to help us kind of differentiate between that viable uh, and the failed pregnancy. Uh, But before we do that, let's back up a little bit and let's kind of think big picture uh, about the first trimester, right? The patients that come to our department for care and our assessment uh, of these patients in the ED uh, in the first trimester. And obviously this is different than what OB is going to do because their um, their perspective, you know, for normal, healthy first trimester kind of establishment of care visits are going to be very, very, very much different, right? But when we see them in the ED, they're coming for unscheduled care. They're coming in with a, usually a complaint-based care. Um, I have this issue, what's going on? And so we need to kind of walk through that from that perspective, right? So there's really three factors that we're going to use in the evaluation of women in their first trimester, right? So one of them is going to be the history and the physical, right? The next one's going to be labs. And the third one's going to be this ultrasound, right? So kind of the first one, the history and physical, um, you know, we'll take, you know, kind of take them in turn here. The history and physical, I mean, this sets up everything, right? They say not 85% of all diagnoses are made uh, using your history and physical exam. You know, whether that number is 85%, 80%, 90%, I don't know. I think it probably varies between uh, patient and patient and between uh, complaint and complaint. Um, but really the history and exam sets the stage uh, for what follows next, right? Uh, if you get a patient who says, you know, fever, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, right lower quadrant pain, that's going to be a totally different story than a person who comes in with, you know, pelvic pain and vaginal bleeding, right? It, it, it really just kind of, it, you know, it's an obvious example, but it kind of it steers you one direction versus the other. Um, and a lot of what we discover on history and exam is going to set our pretest probability, you know, for what we determine next or, or determine to come next, right? So what are the nature of the symptoms? You know, when do they start bleeding? How much bleeding? Is there clots? Is there tissue? things like that. And then do they have a history of any of this? Do they have a history of miscarriages? Do they have a history of ectopic pregnancies? Because each of those are going to put you at risk uh, for having that kind of recur uh, in the future. And so, um, you know, some things that we need to to think about as we ask these patients. Uh, And then from an exam standpoint, you know, I know this is kind of talked about in the ED literature or ED, you know, CMA spheres, like, do we need to do pelvic exams on, you know, on pregnant trauma or pregnant patients, you know, in the first trimester with bleeding, and we can have that conversation about what the utility of that is. But let's assume you do the exam, right? Is how much bleeding is going on? You know, do you need to use a whole bunch of those big Q-tips to kind of soak it up? Or is there just a little bit that's kind of painting the inside um, on the exam there, right? And then what's the cervical exam, you know, look like? And then I think this is the really the most important part, you know, is there cervical dilation? Uh, or is there not cervical dilation, right? This is going to obviously not the the end all be all of things, but it really kind of helps guide is, you know, is this a potentially viable? Is this kind of a, a miscarriage in process? Kind of what's going on there, right? Um, noting the fact that it, like, m- these multiparous patients uh, can actually have some just baseline dilation, um, you know, that we got to kind of factor into, into the, in, the equation as well. So, um, so secondly, labs. Um, obviously, these are generally not useful in the ED uh, in the evaluation of the first trimester. Probably the most important thing is the urine um, HCGs to, to say, yeah, you are pregnant and confirm that. Um, you know, sometimes people want to get uh, CBCs. Probably not going to give a ton of information unless you have a historical uh, feature in the patient's presentation that's going to suggest like massive exsanguination uh, or they're like already uh, terribly anemic and they're just kind of want to see if they're, you know, tipping over to the point where you need, the, need blood or anything. But again, CBC is probably not going to be the most important thing. Um, RH status, I mean, this is pretty important, right? Uh, if they're bleeding, we kind of need to know their RH status to know if they need Rogam. Um, you know, if they're RH positive, good to go. If they're RH negative, then you kind of have to mask the potential fetal um, cells so that you don't develop this, um, you know, maternal to fetal 
uh, reaction, right? So RH stat is fine. We need to know that one. Um, and then the quant, right? The serum quant. Um, this is helpful. I usually just say to the patients, like, this is most helpful to the people you follow up with, right? To see the change. Um, for me, a single static value is probably not a, a ton of value. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about discriminatory zones and all that a little bit later. Uh, but a single value is probably not going to change a ton for me. Um, so I oftentimes don't necessarily feel like I have to keep the patient in the ED um, for that value alone if everything else kind of makes sense in the workup. Um, but it's a number that you're going to want to get so you can have the, the gynecologist and the obstetricians kind of follow it up, right? Uh, that being said, discriminatory zone, you know, is talked about in the literature and it's generally considered to be true that um, a, an IUP should be seen by a quant of 1,000 and a, on transvaginal and an IUP should be seen by a quant of 5,000 and a transabdominal. But again, there's a lot of nuance there and we'll get into that in just a little bit. Um, so it's not terribly reliable for ruling out a pregnancy. Um, you know, in the, in the ED, right? So those are the two, two of the three prongs. The third one is going to be the ultrasound, right? And this is obviously where the money is. Um, you know, it's going to be kind of the primary test that we're going to use to help differentiate what's going on here. And seeing as how you're at ultrasound lecture, you kind of, it kind of goes without saying, right? Uh, so we're going to use this to assess for fetal viability, right? So um, the first thing you want to do when you're, when you're scanning is identify the uterus um, in sagittal orientation, right? And look at the whole, the whole uterus, you know, all the way from the fundus down to the cervix. So I usually like to set my depth deep um, so I can kind of scan through, kind of use that bladder as a window um, and see that, that uterus kind of wrapping around the, you know, the superior edge of the bladder, kind of coming down to that point at the cervix where the, there's an angle and then heading up the vaginal canal. Um, kind of deep to that bladder, right? So I want to see this. It gives me a good, you know, good big picture perspective of where that uterus is, whether it's antiverted, retroverted, you know, if there's fluid around it in the cul-de-sac, you know, things like that, right? So you'll look at, look at that. Um, then you're going to turn transverse. You always want to make sure you look at things in two orthogonal views, because if you look at it in one, you actually may be seeing something adjacent to the uterus and just not realize that it's adjacent because you just, oops, it kind of blends together. We've, we've definitely seen that in our practice. Uh, where someone came and showed us a, um, you know, hey, look at this IUP. And it's like, nope, it's actually an ectopic because it was smashed up against the uterus, right? So you want to look in two orthogonal planes um, to verify that it's actually intrauterine. Um, you kind of scan through come from fundus all the way down to cervix and look, you know, is it intrauterine? Where is it, right? Um, I know Bob's used the example of a, of a cul-de-sac, right? When you build a neighborhood, you have the cul-de-sac and you have the houses around the cul-de-sac, um, you know, around that road, right? So they're eccentrically located or eccentrically located. And it's the same thing with an IUP, right? It's not going to be in the endometrial canal, that bright white stripe that kind of runs down the uterus. Um, it's going to be just off to the side a little bit. And it should be kind of high up in the fundus of the uterus, not low down kind of in the, you know, towards the cervix or anything like that. Um, so again, things that th things to look for, you know, the sagittal orientation, the transverse orientation, um, you know, just kind of what you're going to see. Sometimes you may see the ovaries in there. Um, oftentimes you probably won't. It may be, you know, either, well, obviously off to the side, but maybe obscured by bowel or things like that. Um, but you're looking for the, you know, the intrauterine pregnancy there. Um, and once you've seen the IUP, right, the intrauterine pregnancy, you want to measure it a little bit and you're going to get some measurements. First one is get a, you know, an estimate of the gestational age, right? Measuring the crown rump length. And so we see here, the calipers are put from the crown to the rump, making sure you don't include the yolk sac, right? Um, and that the machine's going to have a calculator built in that's going to spit out an estimated gestational age. And this is actually really important to get because it's one of the more accurate measurements of, of gestational age uh, in you know, in ultrasound, as the baby grows, um, the different metrics that you would measure kind of don't seem to grow at the same rate. I know that's definitely been the case for our kids and even for my, um, you know, one of my nieces, you know, the eventually you can measure head circumference, abdominal circumference, femur length, you know, biparietal diameter, and all those may grow at slightly different rates. And there's general truisms, but they become less and less accurate as the time goes on. So this is really important one just going to give us a really solid understanding of, of fetal gestational age, right? And so once we've got gestational age pinned down, um, then we'll look for a fetal heart rate um, using M mode um, to, to document the, the movement of the fetal heart. Uh, and again, there's a calculator built into the machine, which will actually do the math and say, okay, this many blips per second, do the multiplication division and say, okay, this one here in this example has 175 beats per minute um, in this fetal heart rate. And so that really gives us a good understanding of IUP, here's how old, 
kind of uh, fetal stress status, things like that. And so you're looking for, particularly in a heart rate, something kind of in that, you know, 100 to 180 range, right? If you're above 180, below 100, you know, those are signs of fetal tachycardia, fetal bradycardia, and maybe signs of kind of fetal, fetal distress, right? Um, so that's kind of the normal ultrasound. Um, again, from a progression standpoint, um, you can actually see this pretty early. So generally about, so the patient says I'm four weeks along and they're pretty solid on their four weeks. You're probably not going to see much. I mean, I'll oftentimes scan these patients, not, but knowing that I won't see anything. Um, but I've been surprised by, by uh, um, gestational ages uh, in the past. So I'll usually you know, at least try and then get a you know, quant and correlate. Uh, but generally about five weeks, you'll start seeing a gestational sac, right? You should see something um, that's pretty solidly identifiable routinely around five weeks. Now you won't see anything in it, right? Um, that will, the, the, the intrauterine pregnancy will develop um, you know, at least sonographically is already there, but it's too, you know, you know, small that you can't see it. Um, so about five and a half weeks, you generally see that yolk sac, right? That's the first thing that you're really going to see first definitive thing that you're going to see that characterizes as an intrauterine pregnancy. And so in the middle example, you see kind of that, um, on the right hand side of the, the gestational sac, you'll see this teeny tiny little Cheerio, right? That's the yolk sac. Um, so about five and a half weeks. And then after that, about about six weeks, you usually see a fetal pole. And usually what clues me into it at six weeks is I can see the fetal pole flickering, which is the heartbeat uh, inside that fetal pole, right? And so this is pretty standard. I mean, there's certainly factors that will preclude you from seeing this early. I mean, severe obesity will you know make it more difficult to scan. But generally speaking, pretty consistently around that five, five and a half to six week mark, you'll start seeing gestational sac, yolk sac, fetal pole develop. Um, kind of in its earliest stages, right? And by the time you hit seven, eight weeks, uh, it's pretty much, you know, if, if your dates are consistent, you know, everything's normal, it's pretty easy to, to see things um, moving forward, right? So let's go back to this article by Dublé, right? Because that's the normal kind of IUP process of, you know, of scanning. Uh, but our concern is with our patient, right? Our, our patient who's bleeding, who's got some pelvic pain, some crampy pelvic pain. And we wanna know kind of what's going on here. Is this ectopic? Is this uh, a non-viable pregnancy or is there signs of viability um, you know, with, this, with this pregnancy, right? Um, so you know, going back to this article, um, Dublé really identifies uh, and classifies kind of several criteria that kind of would define you know, pregnancy loss. And there's been some kind of historical definitions and he updates some of these historical definitions. And he really breaks it down into two things. He breaks it down into size-based criteria, right? And time-based criteria. So size and time. And we're really gonna look through both of these. So size-based, uh, kind of what you see on your ultrasound and then time, you know, kind of what you see progressing um, out over time to kind of really help us narrow down and make that diagnosis. So size-based criteria, there's two of them. One of them is mean sac diameter and the other one's crown rump length, right? Um, so we'll take these both in turn. So mean sac diameter is basically what it is. You measure the gestational sac uh, in three, um, make three measurements. So you get in the, the length, width, and height uh, in two orthogonal planes. So one sag, one's uh, transverse. It really doesn't matter which one's which as long as you do that plus sign and then the minus sign on the other one. Um, and the mis machine will spit out a mean sac diameter, right? And it actually calculates out um, an estimated gestational age based on that sac diameter. Because again, these things develop, right? And there's a normal progression of you develop a sac, the sac gets bigger to accommodate the baby, right? Um, then the baby develops and you can kind of have a normal, at least early on, it's everything's so small, so kind of uniform, you can kind of calculate out, you know, how far along things, things are here, right? Um, and so um, we oftentimes see this, you know, trans, you know, certainly transvaginally, but you can also, you know, as it gets bigger, uh, you can see it transdominally. And historically, studies have said, hey, if the sac is big enough, right, and the, the historical number is 16, but don't remember that one, uh, if it gets big enough, then, hey, you should have seen something, right? You should have seen something. This is a pregnancy failure, right? So, and it makes sense, right? Is this thing grows and develops, eventually a baby will grow and develop in it. And so at some point, you should see that baby kind of present within, within inside the, the, the sac, right? So like I said, 
um, historically, the number was 16 millimeters. And that's kind of the starting point that Dublay was talking about in this article. Now he's going to come to a different number. And this is the number that we use and number that OB uses kind of in the next screen here. Um, but let's just get into the, the weeds a little bit about how he did his math, right? So like I said, the raw data suggests that 16 millimeters, like there wasn't really a mean sac diameter greater than 16 millimeters, you know, in which a viable pregnancy developed, right? Historically, right? I use that word historically because it's key. Um, now, there subsequently have been case studies of mean sac diameters up to 21 millimeters um, where they've had viable pregnancies. And so he's updated his numbers. But if you look at it using the 16 millimeter cutoff, right, you have about a, at that time a sensitive or a specificity of 100% of pregnancy failure, but a sensitivity was basically a coin flip, right, of ruling out pregnancy failure with, with this number, right? Now, I think what's interesting is the IOV, the intraoperator variation or intraobserver variation. So this is kind of, if you take the probe, if I take the probe, if I give it to Sandy, if I get to Bob, to Diane, we're all going to come up with slightly different numbers. And the variation measuring the mean sac diameter is about 19%, which is actually a pretty big number. So, you know, 20% of the size uh, difference, uh, intra-observer variation, right? So what Dublay did in his article, and I think it's helpful, is say, okay, the biggest one that's recorded in mankind's history, right? The Guinness Book of World Records for ultrasound. Um, shows a mean sac diameter of 21 millimeters that presented that ultimately had a viable pregnancy that went on to being normal, right? We're going to take that 19% error threshold, right? Figure that out. And so that's going to give us something between 17 and 24.9% um, millimeters. I put mil percent, it's supposed to be millimeters. Um, and so let's just uh, err on the side of conservativeness here. 25 millimeters, right? Just round up because it's 0.1 millimeter off, right? I don't have that specificity in my machine to measure that 0.1, right? So 25 millimeters, if it's greater than 25 millimeters, mean sac diameter, there hasn't been a documented case of a pregnancy, a viable pregnancy with a mean sac diameter with no fetal pole uh, or, or yolk sac in it um, that's been published, right? So that's the number, right? If you have a mean sac diameter, greater than 25 millimeters and nothing inside, no yolk sac, no fetal pole, no nothing, right? This, according to the best data that we have, is diagnostic of pregnancy failure, and you can feel pretty comfortable making that call, right? If you're less than 25, then you can't make that call, right? If it's over 25, then, then that's diagnostic for pregnancy failure at this point. And OB, I've had conversations with them here. They, they support that line of reasoning, right? Um, now, the other size-based criteria is crown rump length, right? We're going to use kind of a similar logic as we kind of think about that, right? So think about it. You have a mean sac diameter. You get a yolk sac. You have the fetal pole that develops. What if the development arrests at that point, right? After the fetal pole is developed, right? Now, theoretically, if you have a normal pregnancy, what's going to happen, right? The fetal pole is going to be there. It's going to grow, 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 grow. It's going to develop. Arms and legs are going to sprout. Eyes are going to develop, organs are going to develop, it's going to get bigger. Nine months later, you have a baby. Great. Um, if you have an arrested development, right, none of this is going to happen. Now, at some point, right, you're going to develop a heart rate. And we know that happens early, right? We, we just talked a couple of slides ago that happens about six weeks, right? You see that flickering uh, of that fetal pole because our machines are just, the resolution doesn't kind of resolve something that's terribly small other than it just shows a small little you know, grain of rice that's flickering, right? That's the, the fetal pole, the heartbeat. Um, so that's supposed to happen around six weeks. But what, let's say you have a fetal loss, right? That heart is not going to be beating, but the thing should be big enough to have a heartbeat, right? Because we know that at some point it develops, right? Uh, if you have arrested development after, you know, after that would have started, right? Um, so I guess it's a roundabout way of saying um, there is a number, you know, a size for the crown rump length you know, where you should see uh, a fetal heart rate. And there's a number below which where it may still be developing, right? So historically, this number is five millimeters. So historically, they said if, if by five millimeters, a crown rump length um, of, let's, let me rephrase that. If by five millimeters, you saw a baby, but no heart rate, that was concerning, right? Again, this number is maybe bigger or different, um, but again, it gives us pretty, you know, decent specificity, but sensitivity is kind of a coin flip. But again, the intra-observer variation is about 15%, um, you know, in, in this particular measurement, which actually is interesting to me that this one's smaller because it's a, you know, you're measuring a smaller thing, but it's the, the numbers that are, that are reported, right? So if we do the math, right, one of the biggest 
uh, crown rump lengths that we've had on record that didn't have a heartbeat that became viable was six millimeters, right? Add that 15 millimeter or 15% threshold is going to give you a 5.1 to 6.9 millimeter kind of variation, right? Um, in terms of variation. So round it up again to seven. So the number that we're going to go off of is if you have a fetal, a fetal pull, right? That's greater than seven millimeters and you have not yet developed a heartbeat. Well, that's diagnostic of pregnancy loss because it probably means you had something in it, it, it quit, right? Um, if it's underneath seven millimeters, theoretically, it could still be just developing enough to the point where you haven't had that heartbeat start yet, right? So the numbers we're going to go with here, and again, Peter Dublay uh, publishes these, the OB folks uh, go by these 25 millimeters, you know, greater than 25 millimeters mean sac diameters, diagnostic of pregnancy loss, greater than seven millimeters fetal pull without a heartbeat, right? Uh, is going to be diagnostic of pregnancy loss or pregnancy failure in this situation. So that makes sense, kind of two size-based criteria. And those are kind of the easy ones here. The next one, as we get into, are going to be time-based criteria. And these become maybe a little less applicable to the emergency department, especially if it's the first visit to us. If it's a subsequent visit, it may be something that we need to know. But certainly uh, some criteria that the OB folks will need to know as they kind of process through uh, in follow-up after we've taken care of the patient. So there's time from gestational sac development and time from yolk sac development. Um, and we, again, using this logic of in a normal pregnancy, we should see these things develop kind of in sequence and kind of get bigger and kind of happen. Uh, if you don't see this, if you see, an, you know, the development's arrested at some point, uh, then you know something's going on, right? So again, the main criteria that we're going to be going off of is, or the main timeline we're going to offer is five, five and a half, six weeks from gestational sac to yolk sac, yolk sac to fetal pulse. So that all happens in kind of that one week time frame, give or take a little bit, right? Um, usually we can say kind of, you know, fudge factor of kind of a, a half a week. So I don't know if it doesn't quite get there by five and a half weeks, you know, give it a little bit of time and you know, it gets there, right? So there's these two criteria, basically, if the first ultrasound you identified a gestational sac or a yolk sac, right, that's kind of the two entry criteria, the two starting points, right, then you need to wait a certain amount of time till you have lack of a fetal pole with a heartbeat uh, to call it a pregnancy failure, right? So the numbers are 14 days from gestational sac to fetal pole with a heartbeat, right? If, you, if you've gone 14 days, right, from when you first identified a gestational sac and you still have not yet to develop a fetal heart, or uh, a um, um, a fetal pole with a heartbeat, that's diagnostic of pregnancy loss. Same thing. Remember the yolk sac develops about a half a week later than the gestational sac, right? So you basically knock a half a week off, you know, 11 days. So 14 minus, you know, in this situation, three is 11, right? So it's almost a half a week, three and a half days, something like that. Uh, if you go from seeing a yolk sac on your first ultrasound to, oh yeah, I haven't got a fetal pole with a heartbeat 11 days later, that's diagnostic of pregnancy loss. And if you are underneath those time windows, then you still have a few days to wait before you bring the patient back and rescan them before you definitively call it, right? You can say things are concerning, but to definitively call it, you have to say, uh, wait that 14 days or the 11 days from gestational sac development or yolk sac development, respectively. Does that make sense? Kind of a lot of numbers to kind of keep in mind or to throw out there. Um, with the time that we have remaining, I do want to talk a little bit about this concept of the discriminatory zone, right? Because this is significantly controversial. Um, you know, I haven't talked to the OB folks um, about how much they rely on this, but my gut is that they kind of rely on this a little bit more than we do. I think emergency medicine tends to have a, a degree of skepticism um, about, you know, relying heavily on a single value or sing single numbers, because uh, our job is to find the needle in the haystack, and you have to be skeptical to do that. Um, so it's just a different perspective, but I think we need to talk a little bit about kind of this, this concept, right? Um, and I'm gonna just lead with saying, I don't believe that the discriminatory zone should be used uh, in the ED as a primary way to diagnose pregnancy failure or non intrauterine pregnancy, i.e. ectopic pregnancy, right? I think you need to rely on other methods, but it certainly you look at this and see if it's consistent with or concordant with the, the clinical scenario that's playing out in front of you, right? Um, and the reason why is there's a huge degree of overlap between um, what the HCG level is between the different categories of viable, non-viable, and uh, ectopic pregnancy, right? Uh, so you can't really get a single value and say it fits in this, this, um, this 
neat and tidy bucket. And I should put it in here. I have it in my other lecture. There was a, uh, a graph that was published in one of the New England Journal articles, uh, which it showed kind of a ascending level of HCG and a descending level of, of HCG over time. Um, and certainly there is the categories of, you know, non-viable, ectopic, uh, viable, right? Um, but there is a significant band of overlap um, between several of those different categories, making it really hard to decipher, um, you know, for some of these cases, right? Um, but let's just kind of go with this whole concept of generally speaking, by a, a level of about a thousand, right? You should see something on a transvaginal ultrasound, right? So they say, if you want to know kind of the traditional teaching, uh, a, um, a quant level of a thousand to two thousand, and this is um, milliunits per milliliter, um, should be consistent with seeing an IUP on a transvaginal ultrasound. So that's kind of the discriminatory threshold, right? If you if you scan, and, and the logic kind of goes like this: if you scan someone with the TV, right, and you don't see anything, right, and their quant is let's just pick some egregious number, eight thousand, right. Theoretically, you should be seeing an IUP. And so it really should raise a question of, okay, is this ectopic, right? Now, it's a little bit more muddy when you get closer to that discriminatory zone and say, okay, the quant is 1500. Now, what do I do, right? Could this be viable? Could I just not see anything yet? Yeah. Um, or let's say the quant's 500 and I don't see anything. Probably just too early, right? Now, again, tough to make that call. Right. So let's talk a little bit about this kind of that at the 2000, the 3000 range, right. And put some numbers around this, right. And um, get, look into the data. So according to the Dublais article here, he said uh, for testing this discriminatory zone threshold, and he was looking at it mostly to distinguish ectopic versus non-viable, right. Um, you know, I think you're, the likelihood of having a viable pregnancy goes down as your quant goes up when you don't see anything. Right. Um, so at the level of 2000, right, um, in their cohort that they were looking at here, uh, one was viable, 19 was ectopic, and 38 was non-viable, right? When you bring your quant up to 3000, right, you're looking at 170 and 140, right? So you basically, um, you know, in this discriminatory zone, that 2000 to 3000, you have kind of a two to one non-viable to ectopic rate, but still it's not very clear. So I think it's hard to make that call and say, hey, look, I have a quant that's 2,500. I don't see anything on my ultrasound. It's got to be ectopic. You know, I don't know. Like the data really kind of shows that it's not necessarily clear, right? Um, you know, now you can, it may be a little bit easier to say, well, the, the rate is 19 to one or 71 uh, for ectopic to viable for 2,000 and 3,000 respectively. And so um, it can kind of give you some prognostic ideas. But again, I wouldn't use this definitively to say, 100%, this is, this is what it is, right? Um, now, the next question is, what about under 1,000, right? And if we say it's over 1,000, you know, what about underneath? And this is where it just gets really murky. Like, we just, we don't know. Like, there's not enough information at this point um, to really be diagnostic and say, yeah, under 1,000, we don't see anything. You know, it, it is one of these things. Because it, it just could be way terribly too early, you know, to, to be able to see anything anyway. Like, I've seen some patients where you, you get their quant, Right, their urine's positive, right? They say they're four or five weeks. You scan them, you don't see anything. You get their quant, and it's like 150. Well, that's why we didn't see anything. You know, it's just too early. Just come on back. Um, the other thought, and Peter Dublay kind of entertains this in his article, is okay. So let's just say this is ectopic. Let's say it is a thousand, right? What's the hurry right now, right? What's the likelihood that this thing's gonna be so large that's gonna rupture? Now, we know that the HCG is not predictive of rupture, right? Just It just isn't. Um, and we can look at it from one way. We can say, oh, well, we can't tell if it's going to rupture, so you have to be super concerned. Sure, right? But you also can't use a large HCG and say, that's going to rupture. That one's going to blow. Small ones say, that's not, right? So his word of caution is in this sub-discriminatory zone threshold, just use care, right? Give patients good return precautions, bring them back um, and reevaluate them and kind of see where this is going. And so his, his um, recommendation, and I think it's very reasonable, this is what I usually do, when I have a pregnancy of unknown location, low quant, nothing terribly concerning, they're not exsanguinating like crazy, they don't have severe belly pain, um, bring them back. Serial HEGs are going to be your friend and see kind of what direction things are going, right? Um, you know, so we don't have to, to immediately jump to, you know, this is an ectopic, we have to admit them and 
deal with this, right? Um, you know, the, the discriminatory zone is helpful, but not certainly uh, binary diagnostic from a binary standpoint. So I guess that's all I'll say about that one. Um, so at the end of the day, kind of how do we wrap this one up, right? Uh, kind of talked a lot about, you know, about, about a lot of stuff. Bottom line, it's a tough situation to be in, right? Whether you have to be the doc breaking the news um, or making these high stakes decision, it's kind of challenging to kind of to process through this. And certainly we don't want to over or under triage kind of some of the, you know, the diagnosis that we're making, you know, for fear of excessive mor morbidity or mortality on either end of the spectrum, right? Um, so just as by way of review, normally you're going to see, um, you know, this normal progression, five weeks to gestational sac, five and a half weeks to yolk sac, six weeks to fetal pole, right? And we have variations from that and it starts kind of getting your antennas up. Um, and specifically, when you have a crown rump length greater than seven in a heartbeat, right? You have a mean sac diameter greater of 25 millimeters with no yolk sac or fetal pole, um, or you have those time-based criteria, 14 days or 11 days from development of either your gestational sac or yolk sac and not have a fetal pole with heartbeat, these are highly concerning, right? And again, if you want to put some numbers around that discriminatory zone, if you have a quant greater than 3,000 without an IUP, it's concerning, right? Now, did it IUP pass? Was it a, a miscarriage that's going to come down? Is it a that topic? We don't know. And so in this situation, repeat HCGs, repeat ultrasounds are going to really be your friend unless you have hard evidence of you know, of like an ectopic, um, you know, with rupture or things like that. So that's kind of the basics, um, you know, of, of pregnancy failure, kind of walking through this article and hopefully putting some, um, some practical examples around that. But any questions uh, about this kind of as we kind of process through this information, kind of try to bring this to the bedside.